The unofficial announcee time of this, uh, I want to just remind some folks about what's coming up. Um, uh, in your bulletin, you'll see a flyer that uh, talks a little bit about the Crop Walk and Church World Service. Uh, that is this coming weekend on the 20th. We're doing the Crop Walk. It is an awareness-raising event. How many of you sometimes forget that there's more going on in the world than what you have personally going on? It's hard because we're all super busy, right? And that stuff that's in front of us kind of takes our attention. This is a reminder for us to know that there are people in the world that God loves that have different needs than us. And sometimes they struggle with things like clean water and uh, sufficient food, transportation, health, and different things. Church World Service works to try to alleviate some of those things. And for us, as the Church of the Brethren, this is really close to our heart because we've been involved with this particular ministry forever since it began, that we were one of the founding denominations of, of this work. And so it's close to our heart. Uh, I think, so I, where's Leroy? I saw Leroy. Is he doing the, okay, so I didn't know for sure and I felt like I was going to put him on the spot. Leroy's collecting for this out there. If you want to make a donation to Church World Service, I can assure you that it goes to very good work. And so that's out there. The, the walk itself is coming up on next Sunday on the 20th. I know that Dave and Estella are representing us uh, there, and so it's, uh, it's an idea just saying, we need to be a little more aware of some of the needs of our sisters and brothers around the world. So that's coming up next weekend. The following weekend is something. <laughs> she rolls her eyes at me. <laughs> the bazaar on the 26th is, is coming up. If, if you have not been contacted by Pat or one of Pat's representatives, I don't know where you've been. You've been somewhere, I don't know, but not around here because Pat's done a wonderful job of soliciting help. We want to extend that invitation to you. There is still, we have need for uh, baked goods and different things. If you've got something that would go into Granny's attic, some nice second-hand item, uh, you're welcome to bring that. Um, should, we can always use many volunteers. Uh, so if you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I kind of had that blocked out on my calendar and I, and, and I need to make sure I commit, um, talk to Pat, and she'd love to get uh, that down. So... Baked goods, stuff for the, for the different, uh, different departments in the bazaar coming up. So we're still soliciting and building that. And so, but I want to extend the invitation to you to come and be present. And maybe shop and buy some things. Uh, but also, we get a lot of folks coming in from the neighborhood. A lot of people. This is the bazaar season. And so people come from all over. And it's our chance to love on them. It's our chance to share Jesus with them. And so I want to invite you as congregation members to be present and loving to the people. And it's a bazaar, so it, not, it may not be easy. <laughs> so sometimes people can get a little frustrating. But if we can be here and exhibiting the love of Jesus to these folks, they're going to feel that and they're going to respond to it. So we want to encourage you to do that. Now, that's announcements. We have something special I want to do this morning before we begin. I want to invite Gary and Marianne to come forward. Yes. Gary and Marianne are going to Tennessee, Kentucky. I get Tennessee. Okay, so they are going to Tennessee. Uh, they're going to represent uh, uh, not just our district, but also the district of South, Southeastern, Southwestern District, Pacific Southwest. Thank you. <laughs> Um, it's, it's a collaborative thing. We don't get the disasters out west that they get back east. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be done there. They're going to work on a project. I think it started in 2021. So some tornadoes that went through the area, and so they're doing some rebuilding. Um, we wanna, we're going to play a blessing on them, but before we do that, we want to remind you that this is a work that the Church of the Brethren has done for a long time. And if you have watched the news recently you might be thinking that there might be a need for this. Um, there's going to be enormous rebuilding in uh, North Carolina, in Kentucky, and Georgia, and Florida. So there'll be multiple projects that they're going to get going through Brethren Disaster Ministries that we can be a part of. Yeah, it's, a, it's something that, that is, is going to be, and it's something that we can really be unified on because whatever else we may disagree on, we can agree on the fact that Jesus wants us to help people. So we'll do that together. But for you two, Can I just say absolutely, yeah. I just want to let everybody here that's approached me in the last couple of weeks about their support for Marianne and I that we talked about, you know, and, and I appreciate the 
district, you know, sending us our prayers as well. Uh, our stint in uh, Dawson Springs, Kentucky, if everything goes well, could finish up this year, which means we've been, have been brethren there for two years every month working in Dawson Springs to rebuild houses that were going away in the tornado. So, and I'm, and I'm not trying to take things away from other things that we do here right. like today and whatnot, but it's what Marianne and I are passionate about and we're looking forward there and hopefully in two weeks, the two weeks stint that we're there, that we can maybe finish up there. Yeah. But it is really rewarding and, and I, and I want to thank everybody who's offered us, um, you know, support. And that does mean a lot to us. Yeah. And you could go with us too. That's, that's the thing right there. If you know which end of the hammer to hold, you don't, have to. You don't even have to know which end of the hammer to hold. They'll teach you that. Um, uh, my guess is that we're, we're going to be, we're going to have plenty of opportunity to send people to these, these places because the project's going to be big. I so. have had some people wanting to go and we're not, we're, I'm struggling at the last minute to work yeah. that out. So please don't give up on me. Uh, <laughs> next year, maybe yeah. I can be better prepared for. We're, we're with you on it. Okay, yep, right. we'll work together on that. So let's, if you would, bow with me. Lord, we are grateful that Gary and Marianne are willing to share of their life and their experience in this place that is so needful. We are grateful for the work of Brethren Disaster Ministries, the way that they come for the long haul and they continue until work is done. And we know that they plant a seed when they do this, that people get a better sense of who you are through these willing hands and these open hearts. So we pray for protection for Gary and Mary Ann as they travel. We ask that you would surround them with your love and grace. Give them strength as they continue to do this work. And Lord, we ask that your good news would go out through their hands. Bring them home again. And Lord, help us keep our hearts open to this very important ministry. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right, now I'm going to let you go back and sit down. So, in, in case you're looking at my pants here, I forget to show you the worst thing that can happen to you. That's the worst. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Let's begin. I think... Most of you probably know that this is Pastor Appreciation Month. <laughs> John's favorite day, I just heard. <laughs> and in particular, the second Sunday is Pastor Appreciation Day. And so, John, we just wanted to acknowledge to you that you're not appreciated just in October. We appreciate you all year long. You are a well-loved piece of this congregation. Um, and we hope that you feel that from us when we may not be so quick to tell you that personally. You're a great listener. You always have an open mind and heart and hear people. And I just want you to know um, that we're just glad and appreciate the fact that you are you and that you are our pastor. So there is a basket of cards out front from your church family and we hope you have a great day, month, and you. Thank you. Because this is how we do things, we say thank you for thank yous, um, and I'm going to say thank you for the thank you, and I, and I do, and, and I have to say how much I love this congregation. You are a joy. It is, it is just a, a, a wonderful thing to be able to do this. I, I get to talk to pastors quite a bit. I talk to pastors throughout the denomination. I talk to pastors out of our tradition, and let me tell you, not every scenario is great. Not every congregation is supportive. Not every pastor leans into and is able to enjoy this kind of relationship. And so I am truly, truly, deeply grateful that God has called me to this space so that I can help us together move closer to Jesus. You are my heart. And so we will travel together. So, and thank you for the acknowledgement too. I do appreciate that.
Yeah, that's enough. You're going to hear more from me later. So. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you today on this lovely October day. Um, surprise, I'm worship leader today, okay? <laughs> All right, I wanted to start with um, what an amazing weekend we had at District Conference. It was well attended. Um, for speakers, we had Jeff Carter, president of Bethany, and we also had Sean Flory Replogue, who is with the Church of the Brethren Ministry Office. Uh, the fellowship was fantastic. We had a baptism on Saturday. And uh, hopefully next year, you all can plan to attend because it was amazing. Thank you, Chris, for the kitchen help. Glenda in there too. And uh, we'll proceed from here. Okay, so kids, can I have you come up, please? So as Pat said, today is a day of recognition. It is Pastor Appreciation Sunday, and I have been asked to speak from the unique perspective of being married to the pastor. So I want to start off by saying the calling to be a pastor is not for the faint of heart. It requires one's all. There are highs, there's lows, and there needs to be a consistent connection of heart, mind, and soul to the Lord so that you can move through day after day, moment after moment. I wanted to talk about some of the attributes that I and probably most of you see in John. There are no particular order, and I'm sure there's way more. I just picked these, okay? So let's start with loyal. John is loyal to his calling. He shows a firm and constant support to serving the Lord and those he has been called to serve. Humble. John has a humble heart, a servant's heart. Caring. I have seen the care and compassion that John shows, whether supporting someone going through a crisis or preparing a service for a family that is saying goodbye to a loved one. Teacher. I see the many hours and hours and hours that John spends reading and praying and writing sermons and lessons for all of you. Challenger, whether we like it or not, John is constantly challenging each of us to grow in our spiritual lives, to fully embrace God's calling, to love him with all our hearts and minds and souls and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Good listener. John is willing to listen to both sides. He will take the time to listen, whether it's after church, he'll take a phone call at night or an email, day off, it doesn't matter. He's always available because he cares. Peacemaker. John will listen to both sides and try to help begin the process of transformation, of beginning to build a bridge to understanding one another. And last but not least, John, you are faithful. You are faithful to the Lord, you are faithful to his calling, and you are faithful to this congregation and beyond. John, today we recognize all you do, and we as a congregation say thank you. We thank you for your leadership, your guidance, your encouragement, your love, and for showing us what being a servant of Christ looks like. So. Thank 
Thank you, kids. Oh, no. Thank you. To you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Just so you know, we all we love you, and we're in this together. And it is our privilege and our honor always to walk with you. All right, and we continue on day by day. Okay, so I think now I'm going to be reading the scripture, and it's coming from Luke 21. But I'm going to start at, at verse 12 because it kind of gives continuity through 19. What? You, oh, okay, I can start at 5. You're pushing it now. No. <laughs> okay, so we'll start at verse 5. Okay, so some of the disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they ask, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? He replied, watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. Thank you. Please stand. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou art my star, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, 
All right, would the ushers come forward, please? <clears throat> So for today's passage for offering, I would like to read from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 11. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Now is our time to participate in God's plan. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all of the gifts that you give us, seen and unseen. We thank you for your promise of eternal life. We thank you for your Son who makes this possible. I ask that you bless us all today and take these offerings and use them for the glory of your kingdom. It is in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You're all very sneaky, sneaky. <laughs> Hello. I want to, I had a, I had a kid's story that I was going to give you last week, but we had something different and I did that. And so I've got it this week, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to save it for next week. And by now you're super curious about what that is, right? Yeah. You're going to come back and go, oh, I got to figure that out. But I have to, I have to talk about this. And I want to say, first of all, how grateful I am, how thankful I am for all of you and your participation. And it makes me feel really good. And I just, I, I'm just a little bit overwhelmed. All these things and the signs, can you see that? Humble, a challenger, caring, loyal, all those different things. I try to do those things. But I'm going to tell you something. Doing this stuff isn't always easy, is it? Are you guys, do you feel like you can do these things? Sometimes. Is it sometimes hard? Beckett, I see you've got the peacemaker sign. All right? And I should ask your sister how good you are at making peace. Or maybe I shouldn't. I don't know. She has the challenger sign, which might be just right for her. I don't know. Should I? Yeah. So, but these aren't always easy things to do, are they? You know what it takes? Practice. You know what else it takes more than practice? Jesus. All of these things that you see here, these are characteristics of Jesus. Jesus was all of this. And you know what? If I can be a little bit like Jesus, then I feel pretty good. And I think if you guys can be a little bit like Jesus, then you can feel pretty good too. And the work that we do is just get to be more like Jesus. Jesus. I know you all are doing it, and I know I'm trying to do it, and I know that the congregation, all these folks behind you who care so much about you, they're trying to do it too. And together, this is what it means to be the church. All of us together trying to be a little more like Jesus, a little more faithful, a little more challenging to people, a little more caring, a little more loyal, a little more a peacemaker, being good listeners. How much, I don't even know. There's a whole bunch of them. Oh, 
You know Jesus was one of the best teachers there was? The best teacher. And he told stories and he got people to ask questions and it was wonderful. They learned an awful lot. So that's what I want to share with you today is that I'm trying to be a little bit more like Jesus. I hope that you're trying to be a little more like Jesus. And then together we'll all try to be a little more like Jesus. And then these signs, they're for all of us. We can all share in that. Are you a caring person? Can you be caring? Ah, yeah, that's the right answer. Let's pray, okay? Lord, we are grateful that we have an opportunity to do all these things together, led by your spirit, to become a little bit more like Jesus, to be more faithful and more kind and more loving. And it's not always easy for us, Lord, because we're human beings. I know I sometimes struggle with it, but I am grateful that you give us a chance. So I pray that you would help us, these kids, myself, this whole congregation, be a little more like you every day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks, guys. You can go. Please stand if you're able. We're going to sing, You Are the Salt for the Earth. Because God gives us strength. Today I want to read a portion of, well, before I do, this is why you have to come back for the kid's story. It's a mystery. It's a little teaser there. So, uh, we are reading a part of a bigger story, so I can't read the whole thing, uh, but I'm going to read a section. It's found in the 27th chapter of Acts. And if you want to have your Bibles open to that, to kind of go through this as we, as we kind of uh, talk about it a little bit. But what I want to read for you is the 13th verse through the tw 20th verse of that 27th chapter. Paul is on a boat traveling to Rome at this point. So Luke writes, when a moderate south wind, they, okay, so he's on a boat, they're in a harbor, so I have to place it. 
When a moderate south wind began to blow, they thought that they could achieve their purpose, and so they weighed anchor and began to sail past Crete, close to the shore. But soon, a violent wind, called a northeaster, rushed down from Crete. And since the ship was caught and could not be turned head on into the wind, we gave way to it and were driven. By running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat, its lifeboat, under control. And after hoisting it up, they took measures to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run onto the Syrtis, they lowered the sea anchors and so were driven. And we were being pounded by the storm so violently that on the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. And on the third day, with their own hands, they threw the ship's tackle overboard. And whether when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, all, and no small tempest raged, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. The ancient Hebrews were not really ocean people. It was not their thing. Now the Greeks, the Phoenicians, they were well known for this. They lived around the Mediterranean basin. They'd just go down and jump in a boat and sail off to wherever. They, they did this as, as easy as they breathed. But the Hebrews, the Hebrews were land people. And it makes sense, really, when you consider their origin, where they come from. Abraham and Sarah, the original patriarch and the matriarch, they came from the land of Ur. Uh, It's an ancient Sumerian city-state in Mesopotamia, on the banks of the Euphrates River, over towards the east. Abraham, faithful, heard God's call to go to this new land, and he traveled from his Mesopotamian home all the way to this land of promise. And the journey was exclusively overland. I don't think he had to take a boat at all at any point in that whole journey. Up north from, from Ur to Haran and then south down into Canaan. That was the, how he went. Abraham was a pastoralist, a herder, a shepherd. He took care of his flocks and the flocks needed land. So he was tied to the land. And his descendants were the same. Land people. Now, part of this had to do with that ancient understanding of the sea being a chaotic place, a a dangerous place, a place where there were monsters and storms. You don't go there. And I'm sure it must have been pretty traumatic for the experience for the Hebrew people to cross through the Red Sea on dry ground. Surely this must have been the hand of God, not simply because of the physical nature of the miracle and the way the water piled up on either side of them, but simply the fact that they were being protected from this chaotic and dangerous force, the sea. Now, this isn't to say that the Hebrews never went to sea. There's this great story about a particular seafaring Hebrew, a prophet, sent to that wicked city of Nineveh, Now, that journey, the intended journey, would have fit the Hebrew pattern exclusively overland to the capital of that Neo-Syrian empire. But you know, Jonah chooses to go the other direction. He goes down to the water and he gets in a boat and he tries to sail off to Tarshish. And again, we have heard this if we've been to Sunday school. And the story does nothing to help the average Hebrew get over their fear of the sea. Because on this journey, the great storm comes, the waves crash, the the ship is about to be lost, and and Jonah knows it's God's judgment. Throw me overboard, he says. It's the only thing you can do. And a great fish comes and swallows him. Man, you don't go there. You don't go there. Chaos and fear and monsters and storms. So for the average Hebrew, the land is the place to be. Now, I'm not trying to paint a picture of the Hebrews as a timid, kind of a hand-wringing, stay-on-the-shore kind of people. It's just that ocean travel wasn't their strong suit. They usually depended on others. They would tag along with other folks who were more inclined to seafaring, which is exactly what we see happening here in the story. Paul is taking an ocean voyage. Last week when we talked about him, we left him off in that great audience hall of Festus there in Caesarea out on the coast. And he'd just given his testimony, his defense, if you will, to that puppet king, Herod Agrippa II. 
and perhaps not so subtly tried to convert Herod to Christianity. This is something that we need to keep in mind. Paul is always doing this, trying to convert people to Jesus. Every conversation that he has seems to be directed in this, in this way. It's a thread that runs through the whole story of Acts. Paul's central purpose is, is, in all of this is to proclaim the gospel. He wants people to know about Jesus. It's been promised to him, he knows this, that he would tell the story of Jesus to people in authority, to governors and to kings. He's done that. Even Caesar is going to receive this word. And so this is Paul's mentality, and it's his mission. It's what he's thinking. It's a very specific mission, to present the gospel to people in power. To authority. So if you're convinced in your mind that your mission is going to be fulfilled because you know God has said that it will, then your perspective on everything that happens in your life is going to be shaped by that mission. It's all important to the mission. The mission comes first. And so I want you to keep that in mind as we move through the story. But we have to return to the audience hall of Festus to begin. So we remember that Festus, he's the Roman governor of Judea. His responsibility is to deal with the political and the social things that are happening, and he has to deal with this guy, Paul. It's been placed in his hands by his predecessor. Okay, we're going to do something with this. Now the Jewish religious leaders who've been stirring up this trouble, they, they're hot to have him killed. But after examining the case, Festus is convinced that there's nothing here, there's no case, there's nothing that warrants execution. Now, like we'd mentioned, Paul probably knows that if he's turned loose, that his life will be very short. That this assassination plot that's still going on is going to probably come to fruition and, and he'll be done. And so he's content to play this Roman citizenship card. It's like, no, 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 don't turn me loose. I want to go talk to Caesar. I appeal to Caesar. And so he's able to gain a little bit of breathing room from this opposition. Also, he can follow this mission, which is really the more important point for him. So this gets us caught up on the action. But we need to keep that, these two points in mind. One, Paul is on a mission. That mission comes first. That is, that is forefront in his mind. The second point is that the Spirit of God has been orchestrating everything from the very beginning to this moment in the story. It's all the Spirit of God opening doors and removing barriers. Paul, he's on board. He's like, yep, I'm going to do it. He's faithful. He's saying yes. But it's the Spirit that's doing the work. The Spirit is clearing the way. Luke sees this. This is why he's recording it. That's why he's writing it down and pointing this out. He recognizes the movement of the Spirit of God. So, what was in this letter that Festus composes to send with Paul to Caesar? Who cares? It doesn't matter. All we really need to focus on is that Paul is fulfilling his mission. And the Spirit is leading him. So, like we mentioned before, this, this town that they're in, Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea by the sea, it's got this wonderful harbor built by Herod the Great, the biggest artificial harbor in the world. And so it's not a big thing. Ships are coming and going on a regular basis. It's not a big thing for Festus to send this centurion named Justice. Justice, go down, get a ship, secure passage. You need to take this Paul to Rome. The problem is it's getting a little late in the season. This is in autumn. It's getting, uh, it's getting colder. The winds are starting to get a little bit more stormy. And the sailing season, it's more dangerous at this point. So right now, they're not headed out into the Mediterranean. These ships will kind of hug the coast. And so what they do is they, they get into a, a ship here in Caesarea. They travel up to Sidon a little bit. Then they hook around that little curve in the Mediterranean and start heading uh, to, to the west. And they come to this town of, of Mira. Now in Myra, Julius and his soldiers, they look at the boat that they're in. It's too small. We're not going to make it to Rome in that. Let's find us a bigger ship. We'll book passage on a larger ship. And they find a grain cargo vessel carrying grain from Alexandria. It's fascinating because in Alexandria, down in the Nile Delta, they're producing grain. And Caesar has offered a bonus to any ship that is willing to make this journey during the wintertime because he has to feed his people bread and circuses, but 
everybody's like, you don't sail in the wintertime unless you make it worth my while. Well, they find one of these, one of these grain ships and they take passage on it. So the plan was to sail along that southern coast of Crete, the, the, the next island over. They're sheltered there by the northerly winds that come out of the Aegean Sea. And hopefully they're going to find a spot on that southern coast where they can ride out the worst of the winter storms. And so the ship manages to make it to this little harbor called Fair Haven. Isn't that a beautiful name for a harbor? Yeah, I want to put in at Fair Haven. Unfortunately, it's not a big harbor. They can't overwinter there, so they're thinking, oh, what are we going to do? Paul, he's like, don't go on. It's not going to end well. Disaster is what I foresee if you continue to make this trip on to Rome. And again, <laughs> this is Paul that we're talking about here. Some folks may believe that Paul had a revelation here, con considering how the rest of the trip did play out. And that may be true, but it's not necessary because Paul, at this time in his life, he's a little bit of an unusual Hebrew because he's been all over the Mediterranean by boat. He is the archetypical seafaring Jew. And if there was one, it was Paul. In 2 Corinthians, he tells the church there in Corinth that three times he'd been shipwrecked. So if you're shipwrecked three times, how many voyages did you have to take that didn't end in shipwreck? Probably a lot, at least four. <laughs> So he's been on the water. He's been in the water. A day and a night, he says, he's been in the open sea. And this is all well before this voyage that he takes to Rome. And so Paul's probably able to read the signs. He just looks up at the weather, looks at his watch. It's late in the season. You probably ought to find a place to hunker down, guys. I don't know. He's a Hebrew. They're not supposed to know anything about sailing. And so Julius believes the ship's captain, the ship's owner, who are saying, yeah, if we get to Rome, we're going to be a little bit better, better off financially. And so they decide, we're going to move on. We're going to try to reach this city of Phoenix, a little further down the coast. But if you have the text open, you know they don't get there. Soon after they set out, uh, this northeaster wind, it, it rushes down out of the mountains of Crete and it drives them offshore. The winds are too strong for them to tack and sail against to get where they're going. And so the crew turns the boat into the wind and they run in front of it. I mean, it's serious. You heard it in the scripture that we read. Luke tells us that they did everything that they could to keep the ship together. This grain that they were going to make money off of, whoop, into the water. The rigging that they need to keep sailing the boat in the water. Everything goes in the water. The lifeboat that they got, it's bashing against the side of the ship, so they haul it up and they strap it down on the, on the deck. The, the ship itself, starting to come apart, they string cables around it and cinch them tight so that the boat will hold together. And then they just sit and wait and apparently lose hope. This beating goes on for 14 days. <sighs> Monsters and storms. you all seen footage of storms recently, right? If you haven't, you probably haven't turned your television on. We've had some pretty big storms. Uh, the the obvious the storms are of different strengths, but we've seen these hurricanes, and the two that came through recently, Milton and Helene, enormous storms, hundreds of miles across. Okay. They had huge winds, huge waves, catastrophic was the way they kept talking about these things. This storm in the Mediterranean was probably not of that magnitude. It probably wasn't technically a typhoon or a hurricane that was hitting them, but, but you know this, crisis... Crisis is not created just by the size of the storm. It's generated by our ability to ride it out. Think about the fear of the disciples who are crossing that tiny little puddle of Galilee. Just a lake. It's not much at all. And they're heading across this and the storm rushes in out of the, the mountains around Galilee. That's nothing compared to this winter storm, this tempest in between Crete and Sicily out on out on the Mediterranean, which is itself nothing compared to the blow of a Category 5 hurricane 
really the size of the storm is not the point. It's our ability to ride it. That tiniest little puff of wind, if, 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 that could kill us if our boat's not ready for it. And on the other hand, we might be able to ride out the biggest storms if we are prepared. Which Paul's boat wasn't. It's not looking good for Paul at this point. All hope is lost. I, I don't know, that seems a little dramatic. But I don't know, if you're in a boat and you're getting hammered and you're throwing the rigging out and all you've got is just sitting there waiting to die, maybe, yeah, we don't even know where we are. We're just out in the water getting slammed by the storm. They haven't eaten in days. They're too afraid to take any food. Interesting switch of things here. They don't want to listen to him at Mira. They don't want to listen to him there. But by now, his stock is raised pretty well. Paul is actually somebody that you want to listen to. And Paul says, don't worry, guys. I don't know if that's how he said it. That's how I like to imagine it in my head. Don't worry, guys. The God that I belong to and whom I worship has promised that everyone who stays with this ship will be saved. No cargo, that's gone. We already threw that out. No rigging, that's gone too. Even the boat itself is going to be destroyed, but we're all going to be all right. That's a promise. Not a hair on our heads will be lost. So finally, on that 14th night, they're about out of their minds in this. Somebody smells something in the air. Or maybe they hear some breakers uh, hitting against land. They think, okay, something's coming. We don't know what it is, but something's coming. And that's not really reassuring. They don't know what it is out there in the dark. Could be rocks, could be shoals, could be something. So they're getting a little bit nervous about this. They throw out a line. drop. It's got a weight on the end. It drops down into the water. Tells them how deep things are. 20 fathoms, haul that up. A little bit later, they throw it out again. 15 fathoms, bottom's coming up fast. Something's going to happen. It's getting shallow. Well, you can read it. It's in this part of the Acts, but to shorten it a bit, after they have to cut the lifeboat free because some of the sailors are going, oh yeah, we'll go fix stuff up here by the front. They want to get in the boat and get away. They cut the lifeboat free, keep everybody on the boat. According to, that's what Paul wants them to do. Paul says, hey, take some food. Let's eat some things. You're, you've been going 14 days without anything to eat. You need to, you need to strengthen your stomachs a little bit. You need to take some food. And, and then as they feared, something comes up that they couldn't anticipate. The boat slams into a, a sandbar, gets wedged in the sandbar. They can't go any further. And the waves are crashing in the, against the back of the boat, destroying it, eating it piece at a time. It's battered to pieces. But everybody... 276 people make it safely to the shores. Whew. I'm exhausted telling this story. This is a story that Luke wants to tell. He's, he wants to tell this story. It takes up quite a bit of space in Acts. The details, amazing, super rich details. Luke was there. This is a personal account. Probably. Everything in this story has that ring of authenticity. This really happened. It fits. Everything we know about sailing in the Mediterranean at that time, at that time during that season. And there are other stories like this that show up in literature. It's a pretty common style of story, that fantastic voyage, the philosopher who keeps everybody on board, everything is, is, comes out well in the end. So some people think maybe Luke put this in here just to keep our interest. You know, it's getting on towards the end of the story, Theophilus. Well, here, let's throw an adventure in there so that your, your, your interest is piqued again. Part of the reason that people may think this is that you read through this story and you ask yourself, well, what's the theological point? It's a great story, but what's God trying to tell us here? It's a lot of sailing. <laughs> it's a lot of storms. It's a lot of interesting talk about how they did things in boats back in that time. Normal stuff that normal people do. And what is admittedly a little bit of an uncommon situation, but still within the parameters of what would be expected. The mundane, the pedestrian. Storms were common at this time. This was expected in winter. Examine the rest of the stories. There's no conversions here. 
There's no preaching in the public square. There's no formation of a new congregation. There's no debates or arguments with religious leaders. It's just wind and waves and wet and splashing and no food and tired. And we're out of we're, bad judgment all the way around. It's not even really a stretch to think that Paul just had tapped into his experience as one of the few well-traveled Hebrews to warn them that this voyage was doomed. We can think of it as revelation, and certainly there's a part of that when we consider that there was an angel involved with his vision, but the angel's just telling him what's going to happen, which was pretty expected by that point. And so we've got to think a little more deeply about this story to get at what the Spirit might be telling us. I mean, it's here. It's in the text. It's in the Bible. The Spirit allowed Luke to take his time writing down all of these interesting details. So what is it that the Spirit's saying? I'll be honest, I had to think about this a little bit. I love this story. This is a wonderful story. It's amazing. Woo, high adventure on the high seas. But what does it mean? Why is it here? Well... As I was thinking about it, I'm thinking, well, you know what? I don't know if I want to turn this into a miracle story. I mean, it's amazing. And I'm sure that the people in the boat were like going, well, that was a miracle that we were saved. But we use that kind of miracle language all the time. It was a miracle that I was able to get my shopping done last week. Really? Is that a miracle? It is miraculous that they survived. And yeah, there is a supernatural element when we talk about this vision that Paul had. But compare it to the story that we see in Mark 4. I referenced that a little bit earlier. The disciples, they're in this boat and they're trying to cross the Sea of Galilee. Just a puddle, a little lake, okay? Compare that. And a great storm comes up on Galilee and it's it's tossing them around. It's threatening to swamp the boat and the disciples are there and Jesus is there. You know where he is. He's not steering the boat. He's taking a nap, all right? He's on a cushion. He's taking a nap and his disciples are going, oh! They really believe they are. I mean, and, and, and let's not be flippant about it. They, they could. I mean, this is something that happened frequently on Galilee. And so what do they do? Oh, Jesus. Wake up! Wake up! I love it. You need to do something. Don't you care that we are going to die is actually the phrase that's recorded in Mark. Like, uh, terrible. You need to do something. And so Jesus does something. And that is clearly miraculous. Be silent. Be still. For me, I would be telling the disciples to be silent and be still. That's not what Jesus does. Jesus tells the storm, be silent, be still. Says it to the wind and the waves, and they do. They become silent and still, perfectly calm. Now that is a miracle. I don't think anybody's going to debate that. So, think about this. Jesus, you know the one that knocked Paul to the ground on the road to Damascus with that blinding light? Spoke to him? Revealed himself to Paul? Jesus, the the one that was at the center of everything that Paul believed, everything he preached, everything he has taught, the very heart of this message and this mission that Paul had, Jesus... He can calm it. He can calm the wind and the waves. He has that power, and Paul believes in Jesus. Not as an abstract concept, but as his Lord and Master, alive and well with him all the time, very much present. He'd experienced it in a very life-changing way. And so Paul has this deep, profound faith in Jesus. And so I'm guessing... Paul knows the story that that Mark records. I'm pretty sure about that. He'd heard about this this event on Galilee, I'm sure. So at some point in this 14-day crisis, when the waves are crashing on this giant cargo ship that's trying to make its way across the Mediterranean, when things are starting to fall apart, Paul must have thought to himself, if he did it in Galilee, maybe he could do it here. Wouldn't it be possible for this very present, very real Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, wouldn't it be possible for him to say, be silent, be still here? 
I think so. But Jesus doesn't. Do you think Paul prayed for that? I would have. But Jesus doesn't. Paul and the rest of them have to endure this 14 days of fear and wind and no hope. 14 days of wondering if this ship is going to come apart. 14 days of worrying that they're going to run into some shoal or rocky shore that they can't see in the dark. And in the end, when the end does come, it's not glorious. It's not like God picked up their boat and took it to shore and set it there which is another miracle that happens in the New Testament. It's not like that. It's a mess. They hit a sandbar and the ship comes apart. And those that can swim ashore and those who can't are told, grab a hold of a board. Hopefully you'll make it. They don't know where they are. It turns out to be the island of Malta. They don't have any food. They're cold. They're wet. They're bedraggled. They're exhausted. This is not glorious. In any way, but they are alive. They are alive. In fact, all this whole story, if you were a sailor, you'd probably go, yeah, that makes sense. That's pretty common. I got a buddy who went through that. Yeah, I did that you know, a few years ago. Let me tell you a story about it. They probably would be something about swapping stories. This is all really, for sailors, pretty pedestrian. It's, it's a great story because they survive, but... On the surface, there's really not much to recommend this theologically. Unless we go back to those points. Unless we keep Paul's greater mission in our minds. You see, this whole book of Acts, everything that Luke has been telling us all along, including this story, it all illustrates the way that the Spirit of God equips the followers of Jesus, not just in Acts, but in this room, equips the followers of Jesus to go out and proclaim the good news. Everything that the follower of Jesus needs is done by the Holy Spirit. And so this is the mission, and there is no stopping this mission. No stopping it. We've read the story. Jail can't stop it. Oh, let's throw them in jail. That'll solve everything. No. Mobs and riots can't stop it. Hostility from people of their, own, of their own kin, their own family members can't stop it. Imperial forces can't stop it. Not even wind and waves can stop it. Now sometimes those barriers are overcome with power. You remember the story of Peter locked up in jail in prison. Got chains on his wrists. Bunking down between two soldiers. The Spirit of God comes lifts up his arm, oh, hey, no chains. Gets up, walks the door, the door swings open all on its own. Walks to the fortress gate, swings open all on its own. Walks out into the night a free man. There's some miracles going on here, folks. This is amazing stuff that happens. But at other times, the mission moves forward in more pedestrian ways, in simple ways, in normal ways. As compelling as this story is, and I remember this from Sunday school, I was like, wow, big storm. It's amazing, cool stuff. When you're a kid, it's exciting. But as compelling as it is, it could have happened to anyone. Could have happened to anybody. Like I said, in fact, there, there are 275 other people that it did happen to. Julius the Centurion. I mean, how's he supposed to, to, to understand this whole event? He probably just thought he got lucky. Oh boy, that was a narrow scrape. Sure glad we're all all right. Sure glad I got all my prisoners so I'm not going to get executed. Not a big deal, really. Everybody had similar stories of these narrow escapes. Paul had a few himself. So maybe this is God working in a more ordinary way. Maybe this is God working in a more pedestrian way. You see, God doesn't always have to show up in a blinding light, even though that's what we'd like. We'd love to have the, 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 the amazing, miraculous experience all the time. But it's not all earthquakes and fire and smoke. Sometimes the Spirit of God comes quietly. Now, the Spirit is present at all times, in all spaces, in the miraculous and in the mundane, in the storms and in the calm. And it's always moving the mission 
forward. You can see it in this story. It's the story, of, it's wonderful, high adventure, bordering on the miraculous. You might even want to cross that border and say, well, yeah, God's hand was in that. If you want to see it that way. But it's also a pretty normal story, a normal tale of first century uh, Mediterranean shipping, the risks of sailing in the winter. Every sailor on the dock from Caesarea to Rome would have had a similar story or two to tell. Nothing unusual, really. In fact, they probably would have said, well, what did you expect? Setting out like that, middle of winter. So the question for Luke's readers, for us, isn't whether this is a miraculous story or not, isn't whether there's a miraculous salvation or whether it's just a pedestrian misadventure. That's not the point. The, it's, the question is whether we can see the Spirit of God moving in it. We can see the Spirit of God moving in this somewhat natural, normal, ordinary circumstance as well as in those colossal miracles that we can't explain. See, is the, is the Spirit present even when there is no be silent, be still? Maybe this is the point. God doesn't just show up in the miraculous. It's not like God just checks in once in a while with a miracle to catch our attention. God is with us in the mundane and the ordinary and the normal and the things that are expected. God is present in that all of the time. And because God has this purpose, this mission, if you will, the redemption, the restoration, the reconciliation of all things through the blood of Jesus Christ, that's going to be realized. That mission moves forward. And so for us, maybe let's pay attention to the way that God is moving, not just in the miraculous, but in the mundane. Not just in the wonderful, but in the ordinary. Because I'll assure you, God is certainly doing that. This is what it means for us to keep that mission first in our hearts. To see God in everything. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful that you are with us all the time. That there's not a moment of our lives, whether they're miraculous events that surround us or whether it's the ordinary and the mundane, that you are there with us. This story bridges the gap, Lord, and we recognize that. It's an amazing story, and we love to read it, and we love to reflect on it. But we know, too, that it is a fairly common experience in our human lives. That people make bad decisions, and there are consequences to those. And that there is loss, and at times we are fearful. And Lord, it is true that when you are with us, everything that you do has a touch of the divine and that there is a, a miracle to our breathing and our existing. We know that at times the ordinary and the mundane can, we can lose sight of you in that. Help us to realize your nearness in the things that are big and miraculous in the wonder of our everyday lives and in those fairly common, ordinary, pedestrian moments. You are with us in all of that and we pray that you would put upon our heart the passion that Paul had to fulfill the mission that you give us. We pray all of these things. In your son's precious name, amen.
Bow with me again. Lord, we ask a blessing on your people. As we journey together, help us to seek your kingdom first in all things. Lord, it is good to be your people, to be gathered together as your children, to share in this wonderful life as followers of Jesus. This is a wonderful moment. We are going into the world, though, that's going to be filled with less than wonderful moments, and so we ask that you would give us strength and courage to witness to your great love in places that need it. We pray for those that aren't with us today that you would bless them in a special way. And Lord, we pray that you would gather us again for that foretaste of your coming kingdom when we'll be in your presence forever. And all these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may go in peace.